Emotionally Intelligent Husbands by Dr. John Gottman. My data on newlywed couples indicate that more husbands are being transformed. About 35% of the men we've studied fall into the category of emotionally intelligent husbands. Research from previous decades suggests the number used to be much lower. Because this type of husband honors and respects his wife, he will be open to learning more about emotions from her. He will come to understand her world and those of his children and friends. He may not emote in the same way that his wife does, but he will learn how to better connect with her emotionally. As he does so, he'll make choices that show he honors her. When he's watching the football game and she needs to talk, he'll turn off the TV and listen. He is choosing us over me. I believe the emotionally intelligent husband is the next step in social evolution. This doesn't mean that he is superior to other men in personality, upbringing, or moral fiber. He has simply figured out something very important about being married that the others haven't yet. And this is how to honor his wife and convey his respect to her. It is really that elementary. The new husband is likely to make his career less of a priority than his family life because his definition of success has been revised. Unlike husbands before him, he makes a detailed map of his wife's world. He keeps in touch with his admiration and fondness for her. And he communicates it by turning toward her in his daily actions. This benefits not only his marriage, but his children as well. Research shows that a husband who can accept influence from his wife also tends to be an outstanding father. He is familiar with his children's world and knows all about their friends and their fears. Because he's not afraid of emotions, he teaches his children to respect their own feelings and themselves. He turns off the football game for them too because he wants them to remember him as having had time for them. The new type of husband and father leads a meaningful and rich life. Having a happy family base makes it possible for him to create and work effectively. Because he is so connected to his wife, she will come to him not only when she is troubled, but when she is delighted. When the city awakens to a beautiful fresh snowstorm, his children will come running for him to see it. The people who matter most to him will care about him when he lives and mourn him when he dies. The other kind of husband and father is a very sad story. He responds to the loss of male entitlement with righteous indignation, or he feels like an innocent victim. He may become more authoritarian or withdraw into a lonely shell, protecting what little he has left. He does not give others very much honor and respect because he is engaged in a search for the honor and respect he thinks is his due. He will not accept his wife's influence because he fears any further loss of power. And because he will not accept influence, he will not have very much influence. The consequence is that no one will much care about him when he lives, nor mourn him when he dies. Hello members, welcome to the vocabulary audio for the Emotionally Intelligent Husbands lesson. Let's get started. In the first paragraph, we have the word data. Some people pronounce it data. Some people say data. Either is correct. So data or data. And they both mean information or facts. And then we have uh, the word newlywed. My data on newlywed couples. Newlywed means recently married. So you people who are married, I don't know, maybe less than one year, we describe them as newly wed. You can use it as an adjective, for example, in this article, newly wed couples, right? Newly wed, recently married couples. You can also use it as a noun. You can say, oh, they are newly weds, right? That couple, they are newly weds. It means they're recently married. So noun or adjective, either one. Okay, so it says, my data on newly wed couples indicate indicate means show, that more husbands are being transformed, transformed, changed, but changed in a big way, 
totally changed, changed a lot. We've had this word before. Okay, and then in the next uh, sentence, we see the phrase emotionally intelligent husbands. Okay, you know the word intelligent. It means smart. Emotionally intelligent. Emotionally intelligent means good at dealing with your emotions. It means you can recognize emotions and you can express them. You can talk about them. You can communicate about emotions in a clear way, in an intelligent way. So some people are very smart, right? They're intelligent, but they're not emotionally intelligent. Maybe they get angry very easily. Maybe they act like uh, babies, <laughs> uh, like little children when they get upset. They might be smart, but they're not emotionally intelligent. This article is about husbands who are emotionally intelligent, who are good with emotions. Okay, we see the word honors in that paragraph used as a verb. Because this type of husband honors and respects his wife, he will be open to learning more about emotions. Okay, to honor, used as a verb, means to respect. It's, it's almost exactly the same as to respect. It might be maybe a little bit higher, a little bit stronger than respect, but it's the same basic idea. You honor your wife, it means you respect her very much. You, uh, you want to be good to her. You want to hear her opinions. Uh, you want to help her. You think she's intelligent, etc., etc. You are honoring your wife. Okay, and then uh, later on in that paragraph, we see the word emote as a verb. It's talking about husbands. It says, he may not emote in the same way that his wife does, but he will learn how to better connect with her emotionally. To emote means to show your feelings, to show your emotions, to express emotions, to communicate emotions. We call that emoting, to emote. It might also be used to, uh, to mean to understand another person's emotions, but usually it means to show your own emotions, to emote. All right, we've got the word evolution later on in, this, uh, in the next paragraph, actually, in the beginning of the next paragraph. Uh, he says uh, he thinks emotionally intelligent husbands are the next step in social evolution. Evolution means change over time. So transformation, we had that in the, in the earlier paragraph, transformation is usually sudden change, a sudden, very big, large change. Evolution usually is a small changes over a long period of time. So that's how those two words are different. Okay, and he says he, he doesn't think, he doesn't mean that uh, the old style of husband was superior or that the new style is superior. Superior meaning better in this case, better than. And he's not superior in personality. He's not superior in upbringing and not necessarily superior in moral fiber. Okay, upbringing means how you were raised by your parents. It means what your parents taught you was good and what was bad. That's upbringing. You can say, oh, I had a good upbringing. It means, oh, my parents were quite good. They taught me how to behave well. They taught me to be polite, for example. That means I had a good upbringing. Or you can say, wow, that guy, he had a bad upbringing. It means maybe his parents were very bad. Maybe they beat him. Maybe they were... A really bad example. So that's why he's not such a good person, because he had a bad upbringing, a bad family life when he was young. And then we have the phrase moral fiber. Moral fiber means your goodness. It means your sense, your feeling of what is good, what is right, and also what is wrong. If you have strong moral fiber, it means you always try to do what is right what is good, what is kind. If you have weak moral fiber, it means it's easy for you to do something bad, to do something wrong. So moral fiber, it's, your, your, it's kind of like your moral muscle, right? How much you are uh, good at doing good things or doing bad things. All right, we see the verb to convey in that paragraph. To convey means to communicate or to show. Husband needs to convey his respect to his wife. So he's saying it's not enough just to respect her. You have to show respect. You have to communicate respect. You have to convey respect. And he says, really, it's that elementary. Elementary, of course, can mean elementary school, meaning school for young children. But elementary also means very simple. 
like if you guys know Sherlock Holmes, his uh, assistant Watson, or he would always say to him, it's elementary. It means it's simple, it's easy. All right, in the next paragraph, we see the word priority, that uh, a wife must be his husband's, the husband's top priority. Priority means what you think is important. You know, number one, first importance. Number two, second importance. Number three, third importance. Okay, so those are your priorities. It means if your wife is the most important thing, then you say, she is my most important priority. She's number one. Okay, and then we have the word revised in that same sentence. We've had that word before. Revised means changed. And it has the idea of editing, editing something. It means you already have something, and then you change it a little bit. You correct it. That's, that's what revised means. We use it a lot with writing. Please revise this. Please change it and correct the mistakes. All right, you see a, a kind of a strange phrase. It says, a man, a husband, makes a map of his wife's world. A map of his wife's world. It's a little bit of a strange phrase. It means that he learns about the details of his wife's life. He learns what does she like, what does she hate, what was her family like when she grew up, uh, what are her dreams, etc. All the details of her life. He makes a map of his wife's world. That's what that means. And he keeps in touch with his admiration and fondness for her. To keep in touch with something or someone means you keep contact. It means you remember. In this case, it means remember. He remembers his admiration and fondness for her. Admiration meaning uh, liking, to, to like something. If you say, I have admiration for him, it means you like him. Fondness is basically the same, actually. Th those two words, admiration and fondness, almost the same. They mean uh, liking. They're nouns, however. They're nouns. It's the, the feeling of liking someone or something. Okay. And finally, the last paragraph on the first page, we see the word outstanding. You probably know this already, but outstanding means great, fantastic, wonderful. So an emotionally intelligent husband is an outstanding father, according to Dr. Gottman. He's a great father, a wonderful father. Okay, on the next page, second page, we have the first paragraph. It says, the new type of husband leads a meaningful life. In this case, of course, lead can mean uh, to be a leader. But in this case, it has a different meaning. If you lead a wonderful life, it means you do a wonderful life or you live a wonderful life. So it doesn't mean you're, you're a leader. It just means you're doing it. You're, uh, you're doing a wonderful life. You're living a wonderful life. You're leading a wonderful life. Same meaning, all of those. All right, and then he says uh, this, this kind of uh, husband, uh, his wife will come to him not only when she is troubled, but when she is delighted. Uh, to be troubled as an emotion, it means upset. It means you have a problem, right? You say, oh, I'm very troubled right now. It means, oh, I have a lot of problems right now. I'm very worried right now. I'm very upset right now. I am troubled. And then the opposite is actually the word delighted. Delighted means very, very happy, super happy. I'm delighted that uh, I got a raise at my job. I'm very happy I'm getting more money at my job. I'm delighted. Okay, and in the last sentence of that first paragraph on page two, we have the word mourn, the verb to mourn. It says, uh, when this kind of man dies, he is mourned by his family. To mourn means to feel sad for someone who is dead or someone or something that is gone. So someone dies and then we cry. Oh, no. We're very upset. We miss them. We are mourning them, right? We're remembering how much we love them and how much we miss them and how important they were and how important their memory still is. That's to mourn. You might wear, some cultures you wear black clothes. Uh, uh, sometimes people cry. Sometimes people don't talk. Whatever. But all those actions are, we call that mourning or to mourn. All right. And then finally, our last paragraph. Um, talks about the other kinds of husbands, husbands who are not emotionally intelligent. He says they're quite sad. And he says they respond to the loss of male entitlement with righteous indignation. All right, some good words here. 
Entitlement means power, but it's a special kind of power. Entitlement is a power that is given to you. It's not a power you take. It's not a power, you know, someone can be very powerful because they make a lot of money, they build a business, or they become a politician, they're a good speaker. That's power, but that's not entitlement. Entitlement is when the government gives you power or the society gives you power. You don't do anything to earn it. It's given to you. That's entitlement. So males, men, in uh, many cultures, perhaps um, unfortunately in most cultures, I'd say, um, right now, uh, have entitlement. The society and the government gives them special power that women don't have. That's entitlement. Now, in many uh, societies and cultures and countries, men are losing these entitlements. They're losing this power that's given to them. And some men don't like that. And they respond with righteous indignation. I love this phrase. It's a nice phrase. We, uh, you can use it in many situations. Righteous means you think you are right. You think you are correct. You think, in fact, it means you think you are right and everyone else is wrong. I'm right, everyone else is wrong. And indignation means anger, strong anger. So righteous indignation means you're very angry because you think you are right and you think everybody else is wrong. Everybody else is doing something wrong and now you're really angry. So some men have righteous indignation, it's a noun, um, because they think society is wrong. They're, ta they're taking away men's power and that's wrong, or the culture is wrong, or women are wrong. They're taking men's power and they become, if you want to use it as an adjective, you can say they become righteously indignant. But if you use it as a noun, as it is in the article, righteous indignation. Okay, and uh, when, a man, when this happens to a man, uh, Dr. Gottman says, he may become more authoritarian or withdraw into a lonely shell. Okay, to become more authoritarian means to, be, to, to become meaner, to try to be a boss, more controlling, try to be a big, strong boss and control. And then the opposite, what he's saying is, withdraw into a lonely shell means stop communicating, stop talking to other people, become very lonely and separated and isolated from other people. Okay, and finally, our last phrase is, is his due? Okay, he, uh, he's looking, this kind of man is looking for honor and respect that he thinks is his due. Is his due means, is his right, is what he is supposed to have. These, these men think, it is my due, it means, it is my right, it is my entitlement, it means, I should get this power. I'm supposed to get it. That means uh, it is his due. It is something he should have, he's supposed to have. All right, that is all for this vocabulary lesson. Listen a few times and then move on to the mini story. Bye-bye. Okay, welcome to the mini story for the Emotionally Intelligent Husbands lesson. Let's get started. This story is told in the present tense right now. Here we go. Bob is a newlywed. He and his wife, Kathy, have been married only two months. Unfortunately, Bob is an authoritarian husband. Every day he tells Kathy, Cook my food! Clean this house! Serve me, woman! Bob feels he is entitled to be served like a king by his wife. Kathy is very sweet. She's a very sensitive person, and she emotes strongly. She always shows her true feelings. Kathy had a strict upbringing. Her mom told her to always obey her husband. Since she has strong moral fiber, Kathy tries to do what her mom taught. But every day she becomes more sad because of Bob. Finally, she has had enough. She yells at Bob with righteous indignation. Shut up, you pig! I want a divorce. Bob is so shocked, <gasps> he has a heart attack and dies. 
But after he is dead, nobody mourns. Kathy takes his life insurance money and now is very happy. The end. Okay, let's start back to the beginning. All right. Bob is a newlywed. Has Bob been married for a long time? Well, no, he has not. He is a newlywed. Um, has his wife been married for a long time? Well, of course not. They both got married at the same time. Not a long time. They are both newlyweds. They've been married a short time. Uh, how long have they been married? Well, they've been married only two months. So they are newlyweds because they have been married less than one year. So Bob is a newlywed and of course Kathy is a newlywed. They are both newlyweds, using it as a noun. Unfortunately, Bob is an authoritarian husband. Is Bob a tolerant husband? No, no, no. He's not tolerant. He doesn't care about his wife's opinions or other people's opinions. Uh, is, wife, is Bob a flexible husband? No, no, he's not flexible. He won't change at all. Is Bob a tough boss? Is he that kind of husband? Yes, that's right. He's an authoritarian husband. Is Bob like a dictator? Yes, that's right. Bob is an authoritarian husband. He's like a dictator. He's like a strong ruler over his wife. Bob is an authoritarian husband. Is Bob an authoritarian father? Well, no, no, he's not an authoritarian father because they have no children. Bob is an authoritarian husband. He's an authoritarian husband. Is Kathy an authoritarian wife? Well, no, Kathy's not an authoritarian wife. The opposite, actually. Bob, however, is an authoritarian husband. And every day he tells Kathy, Cook my food! Clean this house! Serve me, woman! Bob feels he is entitled to be served like a king by his wife. We're using entitled here as a verb, actually. Entitlement is the noun, but to be entitled or uh, can be used as a verb or an adjective. So Bob feels he is entitled. I am entitled to be served like a king. So, in this case, it's not, an, it's not a noun. Bob feels he is entitled. It means he feels he has the power. He should have the power to be served by his wife. Does he feel he is entitled to be served by strangers? No, no, he doesn't feel like he's entitled to be served like, by strangers. Does he feel he is entitled to be served by his own mother? Well, I don't know, maybe, but maybe not. We're not sure, really. Does he feel he is entitled to be served by his wife? Well, yes, absolutely. He feels he is entitled to be served by his wife. Does Kathy feel she is entitled to be served by Bob? No, no, no. Kathy does not feel she's entitled to be served by Bob. It's the opposite. Bob feels he is entitled. He has the power. He should have the power to be served by his wife, Kathy. And Kathy, however, is a very sweet wife. She's very sensitive and she emotes strongly. Does Kathy show her emotions? Well, that's right. Yes, she emotes strongly. Does she express her feelings? Yes, yes, she does. She emotes strongly. She shows her feelings a lot. Does she emote uh, only anger? No, 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 that's not true. She doesn't emote only anger. She emotes all her emotions. She shows all her emotions. She expresses all her emotions. She emotes strongly and she emotes everything. She shows all her emotions. So Kathy is sensitive and she emotes strongly. She always shows her true feelings. Kathy had a strict upbringing, however. Her mom told her to always obey her husband. Was Kathy's upbringing relaxed? No, no, her parents were not relaxed. She had a strict, a very tough upbringing. Was Kathy's upbringing conservative, very conservative? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you would describe that as conservative. Her mom was very old-fashioned, very conservative. She had a strict upbringing. Kathy had a strict upbringing. Did Bob have a strict upbringing? 
Well, no, not really. Bob was spoiled when he was a child. His parents gave him everything. They served him. They let him do anything he wanted. So he was kind of a spoiled brat. But Kathy, however, had a very tough upbringing, a very strict upbringing, because her mom told her, always obey your parents, always obey your future husband. The good thing about Kathy is she has strong moral fiber. She always tries to do what is right, what is correct, what her mom taught her to do. Does Kathy have strong moral fiber? Well, yes, she does. Of course, she has strong moral fiber. Does Kathy try to do what is right? Yes, she does. She has strong moral fiber. She tries to do what is right. Would Kathy steal money from someone? No, of course not. Kathy has strong moral fiber. She would never steal from another person. Would Kathy try to kill another person? No, Kathy has strong moral fiber. She would never try to kill or hurt someone else. She has strong moral fiber. Why does Kathy obey Bob? Well, because her mom told her she should, Kathy thinks she must have more strong moral fiber and therefore must obey Bob. But finally, she changes her mind, right? Finally, she yells at him because she is sad every day because of Bob. So finally, she yells at him with righteous indignation. Does she talk to him quietly? Well, no, she yells, of course. Does she yell with uh, a lot of anger? Yes, that's right, she does. She's very angry when she yells. She's indignant. She has indignation. She yells at him with indignation, with anger. What kind of anger? Is it anger from being um, you know, hurt? Nah, not exactly, no, no. It's righteous indignation. She feels Bob is wrong and she is right. Bob is doing bad, bad things and Kathy is a good person, so she feels righteous indignation. She has righteous indignation. She yells at him with righteous indignation. When she yells with righteous indignation, what does she say? Well, she says, shut up, you pig. I want a divorce. Is Bob surprised by Kathy's righteous indignation? Yes, he is. He's very surprised by her righteous indignation. So surprised, he has a heart attack. <gasps> and then he dies. <clears throat> but after Bob is dead, nobody mourns. Does anybody feel sad because Bob is dead? Well, no. Nobody feels sad. Nobody mourns him. Uh, does Kathy mourn him? No, Kathy doesn't mourn him. She doesn't feel sad after he dies. She thinks he's a pig, right? He's been a bad man, so she does not mourn him. She does not cry. She does not wear black. She does not feel really sad. She does not mourn him. Uh, do Bob's friends mourn him? No, Bob's friends don't mourn him either because he doesn't have any friends. Nobody likes Bob. So Bob is not mourned by his friends because he doesn't have friends. And Kathy doesn't mourn Bob either. Nobody mourns Bob. Nobody feels sad for Bob after he's dead. What happens next? Does Kathy have a good life? Well, as a matter of fact, she does. She gets money from Bob's life insurance, and now she is rich and free and very happy. All right, good job. Uh, one more time. This time I'll pause. Please repeat the key phrases after me. Now, don't just repeat. Copy my pronunciation. Copy my rhythm. Copy my tone. Everything. Copy my emotion. Here we go. Bob is a newlywed. Good. Bob is a newlywed. Okay, very good. He and his wife, Kathy, have been married only two months. Unfortunately, Bob is an authoritarian husband. Okay, good. Unfortunately, Bob is an authoritarian husband. Good. Every day he yells at Kathy. He says, cook my food, clean this house, serve me, woman. Bob feels he is entitled to be served by his wife. 
Okay, good, a little bit difficult. Bob feels he is entitled to be served by his wife. Okay, good, Bob feels he is entitled to be served by his wife. Kathy, however, is a very sweet wife. She is very sensitive and she emotes strongly. Okay, very good. She is very sensitive and she emotes strongly. Good. She is very sensitive and she emotes strongly. She always shows her true feelings. Kathy had a strict upbringing. Good. Kathy had a strict upbringing. Very good. Her mom taught her to always obey her parents and always obey her future husband. Since she has strong moral fiber, Kathy tries to follow her mom's teaching. Okay, very good. Since she has strong moral fiber, Kathy tries to follow her mom's teaching. Okay, very good. But every day she becomes more sad because of Bob. Finally, she yells at Bob with righteous indignation. Okay, very good. Finally, she yells at Bob with righteous indignation. Okay, great. She yells with righteous indignation, Shut up, you pig! I want a divorce. Bob is so shocked, he has a heart attack and dies. But after he is dead... Nobody mourns. Okay, good. But after he is dead, nobody mourns. Okay, great. But after he is dead, nobody mourns. Kathy takes his life insurance money, and now she is rich and free and very happy. Okay, very nice. Use your pause button when you do this. Use your pause button often. But now, please use your pause button and tell all of the story. Tell the entire story yourself, out loud. Say it where you can hear it. You don't need to remember every word. It's not a memory test. Just try to use the vocabulary correctly. That's the important part. You can change the details, doesn't matter. Try to remember the vocabulary, try to use it correctly. That's what is important. Okay, great. If this is difficult for you, Listen to it many, many times before you try speaking. It's okay. Listen to it as many times as you want. Listen every day a few times for one month if necessary. It's okay. Go slow. Relax. Take your time. After you understand it completely and easily, then, only then, try practicing speaking with your pause button. Okay. Good job. Next is the mini story point of view lesson. I will tell the same story using different time frames, different points of view. See you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, welcome to the mini story point of view lesson for emotionally intelligent husbands. Same story. We're going to change the time a little bit. Let's tell the fir first, let's tell this story in the past 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Here we go. 20 years ago, there was a guy named Bob. Bob was a newlywed. He and his wife, Kathy, had been married only two months. Unfortunately, Bob was an authoritarian husband. Every day, he would tell Kathy, Cook my food! Clean this house! Serve me, woman! Bob felt he was entitled to be served like a king by his wife. Now, his wife, Kathy was a very sweet wife. She was very sensitive and she emoted strongly. She always showed her true feelings. Kathy had had a strict upbringing. Her mom had told her to always obey her future husband. Since she had strong moral fiber, Kathy tried to do what her mom had taught. But every day she became more sad because of Bob. Finally, she yelled at him with righteous indignation. Shut up, you pig! I want a divorce. Bob was so shocked, he had a heart attack and died. <gasps> but after he was dead, nobody mourned. Kathy took his life insurance money, 
And now, today, she is still very rich, free, and happy. Okay, good. Pause. Please uh, go back, listen to that version a few times until you fully understand how it changed. And then pause and tell it yourself. Tell it in the past tense, starting with the phrase 20 years ago. Now, actually, you will notice every verb is not in the past tense. Some verbs are in different tenses. Don't worry about the names of the tenses. Just listen carefully. Notice how they change. And then you can pause after each sentence if you need to and repeat. Or you can pause after all of the story and try to tell the entire story, beginning with the phrase 20 years ago. All right, let's jump to the future now. I have a new movie idea. It's a science fiction movie. And it's going to be in 2050. And I'm going to tell you about my movie idea. Here we go. In the year 2050, there will be a, a guy named Bob. Bob will be a newlywed. He and his wife will have been married only two months. Unfortunately, Bob will be an authoritarian husband. Every day he will tell Kathy, cook my food, clean this house, serve me, woman. Uh, Bob will feel he is entitled to be served like a king by his wife. Now, Kathy will be a very sweet wife. Uh, she's going to be very sensitive, and she's going to emote strongly. She'll always show her true feelings. Kathy will have had a strict upbringing. Her mom will have told her to always obey her husband. Since she, has strong, she will have strong moral fiber, uh, Kathy will try to do what her mom taught. But every day, she will become more sad because of Bob. Finally, she's going to yell at him with righteous indignation. Shut up, you pig. I want a divorce. Bob is going to be so shocked, he will have a heart attack, and then he's going to die. After that, nobody's going to mourn him. Nobody will mourn Bob. Kathy will take his life insurance money, and then she's going to be very happy. She will be very happy because she'll be free and she'll be rich. All right. Very good. So that obviously is using the future, right? We're talking about the year 2050. Now, you notice uh, I, I, I sound like I made a mistake there, but actually I, I started using the present tense and then I switched to using future. That's okay. Actually, in English, sometimes when we talk about the future, sometimes we use the present tense. Uh, so actually, in many cases, you can use both. Uh, I, I, I changed because I wanted to keep using the future tense only, so just to help you remember it. But in fact, when you talk about the future, you can sometimes use the present tense. So don't, don't let that confuse you. All right. Now let's tell it one more time. I'm going to begin the story with the phrase, since two months ago. Okay? Since two months ago starting two months ago. Okay, since two months ago, there has been a couple named Bob and Kathy who are newlyweds. Unfortunately, Bob has been an authoritarian husband during these two months. Every day he has yelled at Kathy, cook my food, clean this house, serve me, woman. Now, during this time, this two months, Bob has felt he is entitled to be served like a king by his wife. Now, Kathy, his wife, uh, she's a very sweet woman. She's very sensitive, and uh, she has always emoted strongly. She has always showed her true feelings to Bob. Kathy, in the past, had a strict upbringing. Her mom told her to always obey her future husband. Now, since she has strong moral fiber, and in, during this two months she has had strong moral fiber, Kathy has tried to do what her mom taught her. But every day she has become more sad because of Bob. Finally, one day, she's sick of it. Finally, one day, she yells at him. And she yells at him with righteous indignation. She says, shut up, you pig. I want a divorce. Well, Bob is so shocked, he has a heart attack and dies. But after he's dead, nobody mourns. Kathy takes his life insurance money and is now very happy. Okay, you'll notice in that one, 
I use have had, have gone, right, in the beginning. Whenever I'm talking about uh, during the last two months, since two months ago, it means starting two months ago and continuing all up until now. Anytime I'm talking about something that has continued, that started two months ago and has continued until now, I'm using have gone, have had, right? But then I change to the present tense. I say, finally one day. Okay, now I change to the present tense. I could change to the past tense. I could have said, finally one day she yelled at him. Shut up, you pig. And then Bob was so shocked. Or then I, I could tell that the rest of the story. The end of the story could be in the past tense if, if I say that happened in the past. I, I decided to tell it in the present tense, meaning it's... I started two months ago, I come up until now, the end of the story is told in the present tense. The end of the story is happening, <clears throat> happening recently. But the beginning of the story, I'm using, I'm talking about what has happened during this whole time, during a period that started in the past, two months ago, and has continued until recently. Okay, again, don't think too much about the grammar terms. You don't need to know present perfect, past perfect. That's not important. What I want you to do is listen many times to each version, pause, go back, listen again, then try to maybe uh, repeat or copy uh, individual sentences, then try to repeat and copy telling all of the story, all of the version, using the beginning phrases. 20 years ago is version number one. Version number two, in 2050, and version number three, since two months ago. All right, good luck. See you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, welcome to the commentary for the Emotionally Intelligent Husbands article. I'll just chat about why I chose this and what it means to me. Uh, I chose this, I guess, because I, uh, I myself am hoping to improve my uh, relationship with Tomoe and always trying to be better. Um, and uh, this is from a very interesting book uh, by Dr. John Gottman. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the book exactly. The Seven Principles of Good Marriage, something like that. Anyway, uh, Gottman's interesting, Dr. John Gottman. He, uh, he's a researcher. He does research on marriages. So his book is based not just on his uh, opinion or experience, but also on research. And what they do is they, uh, he and his group research marriages and they try to figure out what causes marriages to succeed and which, what causes them to fail. And his definition of success and failure are important. Um, success means that both partners report, say, they are uh, very happy with the relationship. Okay, so that's success. And failure means, uh, number one, of course, divorce. But it also means, number two, that one or both partners, husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, are very unhappy. So that's failure. So some people remain married, but they're not happy. So that's considered a failure by Dr. Gottman in his research. So they, they find these groups of uh, marriages, these two kinds of marriages, and then they study these people. It's quite interesting. They study them in a very close detail. Of course, they interview them and get lots of information, but they do much more than that. They bring them in to their research, um, I don't know if you want to call it a lab, office maybe. They bring them into their office and then uh, many times, and they have them discuss different topics. And sometimes they argue, sometimes they agree, whatever, but they have the husband and wife talk about topics. While they're, being, while they're talking, they, uh, they measure their heart rate and their sweat glands, how much they're sweating. They also videotape them very closely, especially their faces, their emotions. And after these uh, 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 videotaped conversations, after this research, they go back, they watch the videotape, uh, the videotape step by step, like each frame. When they do it, when they watch it very slow like that, they can see very quick gestures, very quick emotions on the face. Uh, when you're just looking at normal speed, you don't see them. But when you look at a video and you go slow, slow motion, you can see really quickly some quick emotion show on the face. 
So anyway, they, they have all this information, all this data about heart rate and all these videotapes, and then they study them very carefully and they identify, you know, what are the things that are the same for the successful marriages, the successful couples, and what are the things that are the same for the failing couples or the divorced couples or the ones that are probably going to be divorced. And from this research, he has identified different um, key traits, uh, key things you must do for your marriage to be successful. And this article is one of them. And it's, of course, it's focused mostly on the husband. Other things are focused on the wife or focused on both of them. But uh, for my own purpose, I'm, more, I'm, of course, worried more about what I can do myself. So this is focused on the husband, and one key trait is that uh, the husbands need to be emotionally intelligent. It means they have to learn how to deal with their emotions in a healthy way. And this has two sides. One side is they have to be able to understand and respect other people's emotions. Of course, their wife's feelings. They, he has, the husband needs to be able to understand and respect his wife's feelings, but also his children's feelings and his friends' feelings, just in general. He has to know how to understand and identify and talk about other people's feelings and to be sensitive to those feelings and to care about those feelings. And then the other side of it, he has to be able to identify and understand and communicate his own feelings. So he's got to be able to talk about his own feelings and not just anger, not just, I'm pissed off, but also when he's sad and other things. He has to be able to clearly understand those feelings, handle them, and communicate them in a positive way, in a respectful way. And a lot of this has to do with what he calls accepting influence from his wife. This is what Dr. uh, Dr. Gottman says. Accepting influence is a key part of emotional intelligence. What does that mean? Well, what it really means, practically, simply, is that the husband has to share power with his wife. He influences his wife, of course. He has some, uh, he, not control is a bad word. Uh, he, he affects his wife. He changes his wife somewhat. But he also has to be willing to be changed. He has to be willing, he has to let his wife change him. He has to accept her power. He has to accept her influence also. It has to be both ways. Um, so accepting influence, sharing power, is very important for marriages, especially now, uh, in most countries, society is changing. Women are getting more power. Uh, those old ideas from the 1950s, man is, in, man is in control, the man is the leader, the man says what is done and the woman does it. Those ideas don't work anymore. They certainly don't work in America or Europe, as we know, or Latin America. And in Asia, I know this is also changing quite a lot. And that really, this doesn't work in Asia anymore either simply because women will not tolerate it anymore, right? They're sick of it, and they're not going to put up with this anymore. It doesn't matter what men like or don't like or want or don't want. The women will not accept this anymore. In my opinion, that's good. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy about that. I think it's a good thing. Um, but it's an adjustment, uh, and he's right about that. In the past, men, uh, especially older generation uh, uh, my father's generation, my grandfather's generation, uh, they did have that entitlement. You know, they had that feeling that uh, naturally men should be the leader. Naturally, men should have the power or more power. Uh, And naturally, women should be weaker. They have this strong idea. Society taught them that. Their own family taught them that. So it's hard for them to change. Some of them have a difficult time changing. Uh, They they feel they're losing that entitlement, and some of them do respond with righteous indignation. They do respond with anger. Now, to be fair, some of them do not. You know, actually, my own father, I've uh, I've seen him change quite a bit. Um, And I've known plenty of older men, my father's age. In fact, my grandfather, my mother's father, was not like that at all. He uh, he very much shared power with, uh, with my grandmother. In fact, I would say my grandmother was the stronger one in their relationship. Um, So, you know, we have to be careful. Uh, These are general trends in societies, but they're not true of every single person. However, I think Dr. Gottman is absolutely correct that in general, in modern societies especially, um, things have changed. 
And to have a successful marriage, as a husband, you must give up your power. Uh, it doesn't mean you're weak. It means you share power. It means you are strong about your own ideas and opinions, but you also respect your wife's strength and you let her and you want her to be strong and you want her to express her opinions and that it's a partnership, an equal partnership. Um, I think Dr. Gottman's you know, definitely right about that. Um, if you do this, it creates healthier relationships. Uh, I think a lot of men, uh, these old-fashioned men, they feel threatened, they're afraid about, of this. But actually, I have found in my own life, it's quite positive. Um, it's a lot less stressful when you share power with someone else, when you're a partner. If you have all the power, it seems like it's great. You can, oh, clean my room. But on the other hand, you also have all the responsibility. And that's very stressful. Another thing, I think, from the man's point of view, um, a, a woman who serves you who's not equal, let's face it, it's boring. It's extremely boring. Uh, you know, I know for my own part, I don't want a servant. <laughs> I want a partner. I want an equal partner. I want someone who has strong opinions and strong ideas, who's very intelligent, who's very confident. I can learn from her. And hopefully, <laughs> I hope, she learns from me too. Um, so anyway, I, uh, it's interesting because uh, I read this article. We, did, we studied this article in my class in, here in San Francisco. And I was a little shocked, to be honest, that, uh, about the reaction. <laughs> several, I guess I have to say, several of the Asian students, uh, especially the men, not surprisingly, uh, disagreed strongly with this article. They, were, they didn't like this idea. They thought the man must be the boss and the woman naturally must follow him. And that is the way, you know, the world is supposed to work, or I don't know, God says this is true, or society, or whatever. They still had a very strong idea about this. And to be fair, there was actually at least one Asian woman who, uh, who thought the same thing, who thought a woman should follow men. Um, now, for an American, and I'm sure for most Europeans, uh, it, it, quite a shock. I, I was like, I couldn't believe they were saying that. Um, but, you know, I should not have been surprised. I've lived in Asia. Um, however, I have lived in Asia, and I also know that the women in Asia are changing, and that these men may not like these changes. However, they can't stop it. So uh, even if you don't like it, I think uh, you have no choice. You have to adjust if you want to have a marriage, because, uh, you know, to, to be really direct, um, if you have this old idea and you marry a woman uh, today in modern life, if you act like this, she's probably going to divorce you. Um, so you can try to be the big strong boss, but you know, you're probably fine that after a few years or sooner, she's just going to divorce you. Um, so if you really do want a happy family and a happy life, I think you, you've got to change. Um, and that, I think that's tr as true in Japan and Korea and Taiwan and China and Thailand as it is in Europe and America and Latin America. I think it's true all over the world, really. Um, and I, now, from a women's po woman's point of view, of course, uh, I think this is a very, very positive trend uh, that women should be equal. They're as equally intelligent, equally smart, equally strong, um, maybe not physically in terms of lifting weights, but it's not important in modern society anymore. So anyway, okay, that's all. I will see you next time. I hope you enjoy this uh, lesson. Uh, please go to the forums. Write your opinions about uh, the role, the, the proper role for husbands and wives in relationships. Do you agree with uh, my opinions here? Do you agree with Dr. Gottman's opinions and his research? I don't mind. You can disagree with me. That's fine. If you disagree with me, go to the forums and tell me that, you know, AJ, you're totally wrong. That's fine. <laughs> if you agree with me, that's also great. Write that. Okay, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.